everyone, and welcome back to Worlds 2022 at the Hulu Theater in Madison Square Garden. After another day of LCK and LPL domination, it's the LEC's final hope, Rogue, stepping onto the stage in Group C today, looking to finish strong after their impressive 3-0 start and to get a Western team into the knockout stage. Today, I am lucky to be joined by Emily Ran and Dagda here in the Hulu Theater as the fans have been pouring in with plenty of support for our Group C teams. Nobody out of it just yet, but we are halfway through that second round robin of the group stage. And so we already know four of our teams who have qualified in to the knockout stage. Let's refresh by taking a look at the standings. Of course, it is T1 and EDG up there, top of the table in Group A. JDG and Dom Juan secured their spots just yesterday, having had to play a tiebreaker for that coveted first seed. JDG just barely eking it out, Dagda. It was such a banger, though. It was. That was such a good game. And look, I'm delighted for JDG to manage to uh, take one LPL seed back into the first yes. place, right? Because T1 managing to take it away from EDG. We needed to answer back you know against the lck guys i also just think like these two teams are the best looking teams that we've seen thus far and so this is essentially a best of three between the two of them previously when they were in a group together in 2020 that actually got spoiled by i believe psg yeah. taking a game so it was just so cool to see them go head to head given how talented all of these players are especially around you know team when it comes to these team fights I mean, without a doubt, right? And uh, I mean, it's nice to think that uh, now these teams are going to get split to opposite yeah. sides of the bracket. No, it's and not. Who no, <laughs> no, it's not. You're mad about what's that? What's going to happen is we're going to end up with LPL versus LPL. Well, so, I, okay, 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 that was going to be that was yeah. going to be my response when you're like, yeah, we got the one seed. I'm like, are you sure you're happy about no. that? Because now you're perf you're perfectly positioned <laughs> to draw over to again. draw EDG in the quarterfinals or this something the like thing. that. Last time JDG went to playoffs at Worlds, had to face <laughs> off against uh, Sunin. Then top esports got eliminated by Sunin as well. We basically had an all LPL bracket the whole way through. They just eliminated yeah. all of them. I'm so afraid it's going to happen. Yeah, it's definitely tough. Well, that's where I think a lot of us are hoping maybe Rogue can shake things up today <laughs> and make sure that it isn't just LCK and LPL the whole way. But as Rogue is the last hope for the LEC, we do have to reflect on the fact that G2 and Fnatic fell out of contention just yesterday after very strong week ones from the entirety of the LEC. Unfortunately, couldn't get it together here in week two to get over the line. Yeah, I think the thing that makes this so disparate is because they had a much stronger performance in the first round robin, right? And obviously part of that is due to Rogue going 3-0 and being at the top of this group, but then also Fnatic and G2, in particular Fnatic, were looking in really good position to get out of their groups. Um, and unfortunately in the second round robin, it has not looked so hot. Yeah, I think the biggest thing is kind of the early game just hasn't gone their way at all, right? We were looking at, especially for Fnatic, Humanoid being able to dictate a lot of that pace on the Azir when that was taken off the board. So they weren't getting these early dragons. They weren't getting the early rip turtles. They weren't even getting the early skirmishes either. It felt like it very much started to cause the LEC teams to stumble. And kind of a similar story for G2 as well, where those early skirmishes just weren't going their way. And it caused them a ton of issues, especially against teams like JDG. And also looking at Dom Wonky as well, who were just so good in that regard. And by the same token uh, for the LCS, while each of our teams here in the second round, Robin was able to pick up one win, the struggles still continue for the region as a whole in terms of proving themselves here at the group stage and qualifying into the knockout bracket. We'll see tomorrow if our final LCS team in 100 Thieves can change the tune of that story. Yeah, I'm looking forward to seeing what can happen. It feels like there's still a lot of regional pride, as you kind of pointed out, to, to bring to the table. And especially coming into today, looking at a team like Rogue, I think this is where a lot of EU fans are obviously going to be placing their hope now. The last LEC team is here, but the fact they're sitting 3-0 at the top of the table means that this is the team, your first seed that you've got to rally behind. Yeah, and, and not that, you know, not to say that this is what you would want to see, but they've given themselves such a great cushion. That's the value of that 3-0, right, is you you, you could qualify into the knockouts technically by not winning another game and get a tiebreaker. But even if you win one game, like boom, you're sitting at worst to four and two. And we have plenty of teams that qualify into knockouts on four and two records. And it puts a lot of pressure onto 100 Thieves as well, right? Like sitting there yeah. in group D, they now need to try and uh, pick up the pace a little bit, especially when I think a lot of people were looking at Evil Geniuses as the, the team that was performing the best in the group stage. Mm -hmm. The fact that they're only able to get one win feels a bit heartbreaking, but at least it kind of showed what NA was capable of, like going up against 
predictions to the teams that are now favorites to win the tournament. Definitely. And so here I want to dive into a conversation that we've had at a couple different points throughout the tournament, specifically looking at Western teams and top lane picks. And so bear with me. There's a lot of numbers that are going to hit your screen right here. But what we are comparing on this first graphic here on the left hand side is LEC and LCS top laners playing carry champions specifically against Eastern teams. So we're only isolating against the LPL or the LCK, and the opposite is true on the other side of the graphic. Carry top laners, it is kind of a broad definition, anything that's not a true tank, right? So Aatrox would be included in here, but also Jax, Fioras, Renekton. things like that, Renekton, <laughs> uh, kind of all of it. So it's a little bit bigger of a bucket. But what I wanted to call out almost immediately, of course, is the massive differences in a certain uh, in a certain few numbers. And Daddy, you said it to me off screen earlier today, job of a carry, kind of two things get gold deal damage yeah and it's not going so hot for them in that regards right the damage percentages are damage per minute's very very slim in comparison to what the LPL and LCK is putting up. The gold per minute is there. And I think a lot of this is kind of the way that the team is setting up to play around these carries, right? Whether it's a case of getting things like early Rift Heralds to play through that top side, or if it's even just setting up vision so they can play aggressive in that lane. And I love that you bring that up because the point is not to isolate top laners themselves. It's the utilization of a certain types of champion in the top lane by these teams, right? It is a team effort to get these types of carry picks ahead and in a position where they can deal the damage. But now this second graphic here compares Western top laners on carries versus Western top laners on tanks still against Eastern teams. So that left hand column is exactly the same as the previous graphic, but the right hand column is Western teams on tanks against LPL and LCK teams. And notice this, we deal more damage per minute on tanks than we do on carries. We generate essentially the same amount of gold per minute on tanks than we do carries. And yet we sport a higher win rate with more damage. And yes, while those laning stats are quote unquote worse, that is more the expectation of playing a tank. And so it's a little bit more in line with something we're okay with exiting 14 minutes in the lane phase with. And I think it's the rogue diff here, right? When you look yes. for two of those wins, they're the ones that are picking it up. And the fact that then you can put out a one lane onto something like a Maokai and then set up comp to be a carry, set up the rest of your team, it makes for a much easier game plan, but also one where you can bring it back in the later portion of the game around those team fights. Emily? You notice I haven't said a lot. And yeah. I have a story for you, right? Please. I have a story for you about a Chinese top laner by the name of 369, okay? <laughs> He's pretty and good. And I watched him, him when he was on top esports. I believe it was in one of the finals against JDG, so I believe it would have been spring finals when they lost. And he played Fiora, I believe. And it might have been a different matchup, actually. But he did play Fiora against them. And he is a good Fiora player, right? OK, we, yes. we accept that. Yes, he, he agreed. Yes, hands. agreed. Sorry. He has hands. A affirmation. He's mechanically talented. <laughs> he can play the champion very well, right? But in this, I believe they lost the game. And you know why? Because he did not split push properly. Mm. So despite the fact that he is incredibly mechanically talented and is was winning his lane outright, right? He was not applying split push pressure because he kept joining the team for team fights. And there are different ways you can play the Fiora, right? But my point in saying this is a lot of the times on a carry top, it's not just uh, be on a carry deal damage, right? It's how are you leveraging that pressure and how are you practicing to play like this as a team? And I think what happens on a lot of LCS teams specifically, and I'm gonna use the example of Someday, who I also do think is a pretty strong Fiora player. He brought it out a few times. He actually said in an interview where they were talking to him about split pushing versus being with his team. And he said he feels like he, the team does better when he's with the team, mm -hmm. right? So my, I, I'll say this, I think the stats look very disparate. I take issue slightly with the thesis because I think it's a lot more execution based sure. than one would expect. And that's why I started with the story of 369, a, a top laner that we all accept as one of the best, if not the best here along with T1 Zayas, right? So I don't think the takeaway from this should be LEC and LCS players can't play carry tops because I think that too is a bit specious. Yeah. I think in terms of execution in, in specifically in terms of team fight and skirmish practice and leveraging cross map plays, 
That is where I believe teams falter. To your point, though, they should just play tanks. Yeah. Because tanks are <laughs> tanks are cracked, guys. They are definitely cracked. Like, so, they do so much damage anyway. And again, my argument is definitely not that LCS and LEC top laners can't play carries. It's that LCS and LEC teams cannot play top laners. Back, more back to your point. I will agree with that. Exactly. Yeah. And so uh, that's really what it comes down to, just a little bit of support for an argument we've been making all along. Of course, you look over at LPL and LCK teams, and they can kind of play whatever they want, it seems. <laughs> and still come away with victories. But here's how the group stands. Group C, the one we're diving into today. It is Rogue up top of the table, still undefeated in the group stage at 3-0. DRX just behind them at 2-1. Top Esports cobbling together the 1-2 and two record, and GAM Esports still hunting for their first win here today. That, of course, is going to bring us to Pick'em's uh, as uh, have been selected by the fans at home. We thought that this was interesting because as compared to most of the other groups, this one is not shaping up like expectation at yeah. all. Yeah. I, I definitely think teams underestimating Rogue coming into this. Like, LEC first seed tends to do well at the World Championship. So I'm surprised to see Rogue that low. But I think a lot of people, myself included, are surprised to see how top esports have come out of this. Yeah, I think Rogue themselves have said that. They kind of entered with a little bit of a chip on their shoulder because, again, you have these two massive fan bases for G2, for Fnatic, really storied histories at international competitions. And then everyone's looking at Rogue and they're like, well, you guys faltered last year. You're not going to do as well. And like, to come out with that 3 0 is is just great. Like, yep. I've really loved seeing it from them. I mean, they are in an interesting position as an organization where they're trying to carve out their bit of history, their bit of legacy in the LEC behind two of these more mm -hmm. storied international orgs in Fnatic and G2, just for what they've accomplished in the past. But so far, they're doing just that. Statement first week, 3-0. and We'll see if they can get it done in week number two and move on to the quarterfinals. But as we talk about expectations for Rogue and how they're maybe surpassing many of those, we should talk about the expectations that landed both DRX and Top E sports above them in those pickums, And so let's start with DRX here, Emily. Yeah, so I picked DRX. Hopefully I can do Chronicler proud. Um, I chose Toa because, <laughs> <laughs> because here's the thing, okay? Uh, even people who watched a lot of LCK, right? They were like, I don't know how this team is going. Like, they fully expected them to get out of play-ins, like, no problem. That wasn't the issue. It was going into uh, a group with Rogue, with top esports, even with GAM. Like, we hadn't seen Vietnam, uh, you know, top team in an international competition in a while. So it's kind of like, nah, <laughs> no. Uh, and then the reality. All right, what do we really get? Oh. Let's do this! Because, yeah, I think uh, I think they've come out. I think they've looked surprisingly strong. I think Zeka in particular has kind of been a revelation to some people who didn't necessarily see how well he was performing in LCK, or maybe, like, Dogda, remember him from LPL, where he was a lot shakier. So, And then, obviously, you have Deft in the bot lane, who's just always class 80 carry. So, yeah. All right, well, so uh, by the pictures, I would say... Reality working out a lot yeah, better than expectation then, right? It's yeah. Great. They're here to fight. They're mechanically gifted, least in player. That's what I'm that's what I'm, I'm glad to be that. here now to talk about top yeah. esports and bring us down the other oh, direction. No. Which is not as hot. Okay. Because they started off on Pamani. You know, they wanted it. They are a team that loves to fight, they <laughs> love to take one. skirmishes, they wanted to go ham. And now for my reality, I was kind of thinking going Toa, because it is Wayward's favorite moment, yeah, right? Exactly. But I actually went to different one, which was, are you serious? Which is, because <laughs> when I look at this, oh, no. it's kind of been a face of regret for me when I look at this, because every time we see Top Esports try to take these uh, aggressive plays, it hasn't quite worked out so hot for them, True. especially against teams like Rogue, where we saw that big top lane throw that we'll have a yeah. look at later. But I was going to say, I'm pretty sure I've seen you sporting that face a number of times downstairs. Yes, uh, definitely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, not been, it's not been pretty. It's not been pretty. Right. We'll, see, we'll see if they can get their way back over towards, uh, you know, come at me, bro. From here, let's jo uh, dive into Rogue. What's the graphical representation we have for Rogue? Oh, this is Gam. Oh, Gam first. Yeah. My All bad, right. my bad. So, <laughs> I did Jinx catch me if you can, because I think in having Gam return to the stage, obviously they couldn't make it to MSI because they were attending the Southeast Asian Games. Um, this team historically, back when they were called Gigabyte Marines all the way back in uh, 2017, kind of put Vietnam on the map. Vietnam as a region has grown, has, it's very like fighting. It's kind of like, you know what? Catch me if you can. Like, There's I a little bit of agent of chaos. Yeah, like I don't, think, I don't think people necessarily expected them to get out of the group, but they definitely expected them to be punching up. Yes. And then reality, unfortunately, hasn't looked nearly as good. Uh, it's been the, Oh no. The, oh, which is like the, I know, it's sad, it makes me sad too. I, I 
actually love Gam. I'm gonna go on a rant about one of their players later in a good way. Um, but yeah, it, it just has not looked as good for them. Um, I do think compared to expectations as that team who was taking fights, who was punching up, maybe taking a game off of teams that were better than them, it hasn't worked out though. I will say one of the ways in which I've I've seen the expectation play out on stage is the fact that Gam has brought very early aggression, a lot of level ones, but yep. unfortunately that also means when they don't go your way, the game just spirals out of control and leaves you a little bit more with what we've seen here in terms of reality. That leaves one team left. Back over to Rogue. Dagda, what did you choose for your emotes here? So this was kind of... But a lot of teams were waiting to see how Rogue were going to fare, right? There was a lot of question marks about if the meta would end up suiting them, how they were going to fare coming in as the first seed. But honestly, my expectation has just completely been... Uh, sorry, my reality has been completely different to the expectation because they have been absolutely fantastic. And my reality has Woo! been absolutely glamorous. Nice. They have been fabulous like coming yeah, in. You love and it's been absolutely incredible because it feels like Malrang's firing all cylinders. The control mage meta is still here for the mid lane for Larson. You're getting tanks for Odo. Comp is popping up. I mean, Comp and Trimby look like the strongest bot lane in their group right now. And I am so excited to see what Rogue can continue with. From contemplative to yeah. fabulous in an instant. Uh, it's great to see Rogue wake up here on the international stage. And speaking of a fabulous performance, let's hear from one of the competitors tonight as Shox was joined by Rogue's bot laner Comp after their 3-0 start. Well, I'm here with Comp to talk about Ro going 3-0 and zero in the first phase uh, of groups. Pretty crazy. Maybe not to you. How expected was the 3-0? Uh, it was certainly not expected. Okay. <laughs> uh, I mean, everyone knew that uh, we can do pretty well on, like, on stage, like we did basically in Malmo. But of course, like, since we came here, the first days were kind of tough, like both scream-wise and also schedule-wise. Mm -hmm. So we kind of had to get used to this and basically everyone built his own schedule, right? So we can be ready for when the important time comes. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I mean, for sure the first days were a bit tough, but everyone is mature enough to like realize how it is. And it's up, it's up on us, right? To basically fix that and be ready for yeah, the right time basically. Yeah, but you are uh, the first seed coming out of Europe. So yeah. it's really indeed, nice to indeed. see you yeah. go <laughs> three and zero. Now, when it comes to Rogue, they were of course uh, at Worlds before, but they didn't have you uh, and they oh, didn't yeah. have Malrang either. So what do you think uh, this duo of you two are contributing to why Rogue is playing so well? Uh, I'm, not uh, I'm not exactly sure, but I mean, for sure, like I think, Basically, we are enjoying our time playing together. I think that's a big factor. Like, since we got to know each other this year, like, we had some experience in the past when he was in Damon Kia as a sub and we were, like, playing in solo queue with each other. And, like, I remember the first days when he came, he was, like, calling me as one of my solo queue accounts, Kite Machine. And I'm like, I'm like, oh, you remember me? And he's like, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, from the first time we met, I honestly got that feeling that I would really enjoy my time playing with this player. And it's just been great, like, both in and outside of the game. We are just, I'm just really happy to have a teammate like that. Yeah, the atmosphere is looking great. Uh, why do you think you had such uh, success in the bot lane, specifically both in laning phase and team fights, comparatively to maybe some of the others? Uh, we're talking other about EU this. bot lanes. Oh, other EU bot lanes. Um, I think, I mean, I always knew, at least for me personally, that one of my strengths is laning phase, at least, and I could easily, like, abuse it even more with a support like Adi that just is willing to play anything, right? Because yeah. I don't think like, for example, the Kalisa Soraka combo that we pull out first time in Malmo, I don't think people will like think of like, let's say it's something like Soraka to pair it with Kalista, right? They will be like, oh, you need engage and this and that. So we kind of figure out our own meta in a way. Like I think we were we were probably the first bot lane to ever play like Kate Lux also. Like mm -hmm. now, of course, it became meta because of some buffs, but even before, I think we were like very confident to play it, right? So. I think, yeah, we have this special thing that we are really, we are really willing to be creative in a way. So, yeah, I think it's been great. Yeah, I love that. Um, a final question going into the second round, Robin. We know that things can turn completely on their yes. head, right? Yes. So, <laughs> kind of, how are you going to make sure that you are well equipped to face Top again, who will be definitely uh, keen to beat you, as well as DRX and, of course, Gam? Of course, yeah. Uh, I'm not sure, like, I think I'm just going to have the same mindset as I have today, like, even, even, like, even tomorrow, even yesterday, sorry, when we won, when, and we're 2 -0 up, I wasn't, like, thinking, oh, you know, we're the only team in the group to be 2 -0. I was just, like, I kind of have this respect and uh, this respect for every team, and I also know that it's the best of one, right, so anything can kind of happen, so I really want to, I really want to be in the best shape, both personally and just draft-wise, anything team-related, right? So, yeah, I think everyone knows how a best of one can turn around, so we're going to make sure we go past group stage. Okay, thank you very much, Kong. Thank you, too.
Well, Comp just did my job for me, setting up this next segment by talking about how even they were aware that uh, the way the uh, week one played out really could have gone in many different (laughs) ways. And so we wanted to re-look at a few of the games from week one, specifically from this Group C, in a segment that we have dubbed the remake. The idea here is that there were multiple fights that took place last week that we feel like could have gone either way if one or two things maybe go differently. So we wanted to work back through a couple fights, starting with Gam versus DRX. And I'm going to hand things over to Emily. Yeah, so in this, uh, basically, we talked about how Gam have tried these early level ones, these early invades. This is the setup for one of them. Both teams kind of know where each other is at. So we have the ward here and then up in... Uh, Zoom that out. They're gonna end up clearing this ward right here too. Dash is already losing his mind at my tactics. So as we start the play, keeping my mouth shut. The big, the big player that I want people to keep their eyes on is actually Katie because as they invade right here, you see that Levi and Kaya are headed. They're gonna clear out this ward. They're gonna head up to the red buff invade, and Katie looks like he's there with them, right? Um, on the Talia. The important thing though, is that he actually ends up backing off of this place. So while Kingen is coming down, Pioshik is coming down, and then Zekka is coming up from the mid lane as they're doing this. So as you pause, the most important thing here now is that, oh my gosh. I think there's It's not arrow. zooming the map, yeah. <laughs> we got it. Right there. Zekka is actually going to beat KD to the play. So as we play it out, this ends up being a three for O against DRX. Now you can challenge the idea that maybe they shouldn't have gone for this at all because you think regardless, um, you know, DRX have a stronger 3v3 in this setup. But the fact that KD backed off, the fact that they didn't look like they were going to commit with three, and then the way this plays out, it does the exact opposite. It sets Levi behind. And Levi on a carry like this Graves, which we've seen him perform amazingly well on, right? It's one of his power picks. He gets set super far behind. So when even when they team fight really well later on in this game, he cannot deal the damage, and the rest of the team is just so far behind at that point, it doesn't end up working out. So this is definitely a level one that I think they'd want back. Yeah, three three kills in the hole at that point. But yeah, just imagine if the Talia is there to cut off the rotation by the Silas, or even be there from the beginning to pelt some of that damage through with the volleys. From here, we're going to top esports versus Rogue, though, to break down another game that we think could have gone either way based on a couple fights. Yeah, so I just want to take a quick look at our mini-map as you come into this, because you actually have the Tien with the Rift Herald. They're trying to get it to knock down this last remaining topside turret in favor of top esports. But look at the amount of members that are coming through here on this top side. You already have a bunch of rogue members going to read this. So as we start to see Trimby now getting caught out as Mark goes to check the bush, there's a couple more factors that we have to start to pay attention to, right? You can see that Wayward is down on this bottom side. He actually has TP to get in, and so does the Maokai to come in for Odo Omni. So immediately, as this play starts to go through, you'll notice that the TP comes through from Odo Omni. They're aware that chances are Wayward's on bot side, because he's going to have to crash this wave that's being pushed in by Odo Omni on the bot side. But this is still a winnable fight for top esports if Wayward commits his TP Im- immediately. But as we start to go into this, you'll notice that where we actually get the TP from Wayward is onto this ward here, rather than onto any of these creeps that are sitting in the lane as well. So now as we start to roll the clip forward, you'll see that top esports try to make the pick on Trimby. He buys a ton of time. The zero that actually knocks him to safety. And then we get this fantastic re-engage immediately from going with Omni and Trimby and just pick off Tien even before he can use the subjugate to try and stay tanky. And now by the time Wayward comes in with the full Nar bar, it's an auto and a Q. He's popped his Rage Bar. He actually could have been here earlier, had a big ultimate, could have turned that fight around, but because they were disjointed, because there was a lot of miscommunication on how they wanted to approach the play, and they didn't spot the amount of rogue members that were there, top esports end up turning away from a 2,000 gold lead and a winning play to actually giving Rogue Baron off the back of that play. Split second decisions make or break best of ones, and so that's the reality of how week one went. The question is, how will today go? Let's take a look at our schedule, see what we have in front of us. We'll kick off the day with Rogue versus Gam Esports before Gam dives back onto stage against top. DRX versus Rogue will be our third matchup of the day. And then DRX 
once again will go up against Gam Esports. Top is pulling double duty at the end of the day against both Rogue and DRX to close things out. Any tiebreakers will be played immediately following that sixth game of the day. Now, one of the deciding factors for Rogue's success today will be the strength of their jungler. So let's get to know Rogue's own Malrong in this edition of One Plus. Welcome to the Rift. 안녕하세요. 저는 LEC 리그에서 뛰고 있는 로그 정글러 말랑이라고 합니다. 저는 이번 연도가 처음 월드 진출입니다. 어, 일단 LEC 시드가 4장이었어서 그래도 딱히 부담은 많이 없었던 것 같고 그래도 1시드여서 기분은 더 좋은 것 같습니다. 어, 일단 제가 프로 5년 하면서 결승을 한 3번인가 4번 가봤는데 그래도 결승에서 이기면은 그냥 기분이 좋은 것 같아요. 유럽이 조금 북미랑 같이 저평가를 많이 받는 것 같아서 이기면은 그게 좀 없어지지 않을까 해서 그게 제 목표입니다. 목표는 일단 크게 잡으면은 결승전이고 일단 바로 문 앞에 있는 거는 8강 가는 거. 저희 팀 컨디션이 계속 좋으면은 가능할 것 같아요. 일단 다들 저희 팀 응원해 주셔서 감사하고 다들 제밥 걱정 많이 하시는데 잘 먹고 있습니다. 감사합니다. 포르 몰롱 everyone worrying about his his uh, gamer eating habits. Um that aside, I think the most impressive thing to me about Molrong and what he's been able to do with this team absolutely is his early ganking. So here we see him on the J4, something that you absolutely will be familiar with if you've ever watched him in the LEC. This is the last time they met uh, Gam Esports, and he goes all over the map. You'll see he ganks mid. This is a, a B-roll that goes all the way from here to about like just past four minutes in. So he's here. He's then going to visit bot lane, get a gank off here because the wave is prepped. It's about to crash into turret right here. Up. Oh, Here's Malrong on J4. What a surprise. They're able to get this kill as well and stay and uh, and stay alive. And then immediately back. Oh, guess what? He's back in the mid lane. He's re-ganking mid. Uh, and so, you know, it's just he is everywhere on the map. If you give him something like the J4, where he finds some really creative angles and plays very well around where his laners have their waves. You're here for the early pathing. I'm here for the early umbral glaive and nothing okay. else. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, he only gets it because of how good his early pathing is. But when we compare Dagda Rogue to some of the other top teams in the tournament, statistically, we get a kind of an interesting picture. It's quite di it's quite different. Yeah, I think it's been really interesting to look at how slow Rogue are compared to our other teams that have already qualified in JDG and T1. And even if you look in comparison to RNG, that's on the opposite side. but. It's been a much slower paced game. There hasn't been as heavy as focus on objectives. It's been much more a case of, hey, we're going to use our bot side as this bridge to the late game alongside Maorang in things like the Lucian Nami that we've seen a lot of, and the Callista that we've got from comp as well, and making sure then that we can actually play uh, towards that later portion of the game where we've got more of these control mages that we can play for those late game fights. And I think it is actually really interesting looking at that mid lane matchup, especially when you look at the champions that these two play, because that's where that insurance is for the late game for these two teams because you look across at Larson, it's heavy Azir, heavy Oriana. He wants to be that late game damage, that late game carry, and also with that victory in the shared champion pool. It's a very similar story for Kati when you look towards the Talia, but he has got that backup of the uh, the Syndra there as well, where Kati's dealing about 30% of his team's damage. Like these are the two late game heavy hitters for both their squads, and they're going to be crucial to today's game. I think with KT's picks too, you can see how he'd want to set up, right, around what Levi wants to do as a carry jungler. So you can kind of see the thought process behind what Gam is locking in. And while, and while of course, the mid lane matchup is going to be hugely important, I do want to put a spotlight onto Gam's top laner in Kiaya because individually, from my perspective, and Emily, I'm pretty sure you're on the same train with me. He's been the top performer for me for this team at Worlds so far. Yeah, I mean, obviously, they haven't had the start they wanted. This is his performance, even with how um, kind of poorly Gam have set themselves behind in some of these early games. And I want to talk about Kiaya a little bit just because his story is so interesting. He actually dropped out of school in the first grade, ended up learning how to read and write 
from playing League of Legends and communicating with other people. Um, and so it was kind of a social outlet for him as a kind of a weird educational tool. In his first split with Gam, there were 18 roster changes over what? the course of that entire split. So I think he ended up not playing very well, lost a lot of confidence. Um, but, you know, they, they did a documentary before he like went to Southeast Asian games. It was really cool to hear him talk about his family, how becoming the breadwinner for his family ended up giving him the confidence and motivation to play again. So if you want a player to root for, root for Kiaya. The story is great. I'll link the YouTube video. Cheer for them. The game's about to start. I'll shut you, up. You've made me a fast fan. What a journey to the world stage. We'll see if they can get a win here as they take on Rogue in our first game of the day. Mình không bao giờ nghĩ đến chuyện bỏ cuộc hay đầu hàng. Mình vẫn còn nguyên cơ hội để có thể vào vòng trong. Yeah, but we still like look to go six or fire! The quickness getting one on to mark. Oh, the kick back! All right, it's an absolute god. They'll tidy up the fight. Rogue, the first seed of Europe, goes three zero. I think all three teams are kind of even actually. We still need to go into the last day with the mindset to play like we have done in the past. PRX entering themselves into the conversation. 중국 팀이 가장 큰 걸림돌이 되지 않을까 싶었는데 막상 이제 직접 상대해 본 느낌으로는 유럽 팀이 유럽 리그에서만 뭔가 통하는 스타일이 아니라 그냥 세계적인 무대에서 충분히 통하고 되게 잘하는 팀이다라는 걸 다시 한번 느끼게 돼서 뭐 유럽 팀에 대한 존중이 많이 생긴 거. 今年的话就欧洲队的其实都挺强的嘛 I want to go way further than like win a best of one against top esports I want to win the whole damn thing But uh, we have a long way to go Nếu các bạn đang nuôi một cái hy vọng vào top 8 Thì các bạn hãy cẩn thận Để vì gam support có thể gạt dò các bạn bất cứ lúc nào Yeah,可能我现在打的成绩不是很好吧，但我们肯定会下轮打出差不多分赛的，就也打出二 If we don't hope of the West, then I think we'll do everyone very proud. Welcome, welcome to the last hope of the LEC. Rogue is taking to the stage for at least three games today. Gam Esports from Vietnam hoping they can find themselves a win. 0-3 their start, 3-0 for Rogue. Opposites in the first week. We'll see what it looks like here in the second. Yeah, Gam, known for pulling out all the tricks though. I'm excited for this week where all the pressure is on to see what they've got in store. And I think Gam um, themselves said it as well. You can't count them out, even though they have gone all free. Maybe if they don't put themselves at a huge disadvantage in the first five minutes, they can then rely on some of the team fighting that we've seen from them later on in the game.
And that's what it's going to come down to, really, is, is how will you step up? Because we have seen, I mean, I cast just uh, 12 hours ago or so, like that gigantic team fight comeback victories, right? The, the, the ability to come back with just having better hands in the moment and making the better choices during the fights can always get you there. So it's going to be up to how well they play. And I'm curious what the drafts looked like as well, of course. We saw how well Odo has done on his tanks. Two Maokais and Orn won all three of the games. Does he get off those tanks? Does something else happen? I'm very curious about it. Yeah, I think the recipe for Rogue that got them success should stay the same here. It has been so smooth for them. Odo up top on tanks, Larson on these control mages, big AP DPS threats from the mid lane, and then Comp and Trimby with some aggressive playmaking bottom lanes. And where I think a lot of the other LEC teams struggled was that it was relatively easy to find and identify a specific point in which you could attack them, but with Rogue, every single player just has looked good. I think the area that they struggled was versus the North American teams in the first game of the yes. day. Yes. Yes. That, that was the curse. Good point. Gam also starting the day 0-3, much in a similar fashion. We'll see if they can have the same sort of uh, blue shell tendency here. Uh, also, if you really want to dive into it, uh, partial owner of Gam Esports is Energy Asia. Okay. So, so uh, a North American org, partial ownership. So you it. can. <laughs> I am stretching it. I am. But Energy was formerly an LCS team, right? Formerly LCS. Okay. Org. So if you really want the storyline, if you really want to push it, just for now, you, you can call Gam an NA team. Not actually. They're obviously Vietnamese. But if you're going for the memes, you can you can you can blur the lines a bit. And for me, we already talked about how well-rounded Rogue has been. I'm really hoping that, again, Gam is able to get a setup for Kiaya where he can actually pop off. Because if they give that Maokai to Odo again, I don't think there's any pick that is going to help him out. So making sure that they properly prioritize in the draft and then play it a little bit slower early game is going to be very important. Because with how well Rogue has been team fighting, I think it's very hard if you're uh, playing from a deficit from the get-go. Yeah, I actually think uh, their best game was Kiaya on the Camille. You yeah. know, that split Oh, was, yeah. He did a really good job playing around vision, properly giving enough respect to the enemy team when they could collapse on him, but also getting the most out of side lane objectives. Now, coordination is going to be what it's about, and I want to see if they even get what they want out of this one. It's been carries the time for Kiaya. Will he get the better of Oduwamna this time around? We're on to the draft. Sejuani already removed one of Levi's picks that he's put in the world so far. Also think that the Sejuani as a flex pick has been utilized more. And there we go. There's the Maokai yep. ban that I really want to see. Rogue have already shown that when they get a comfortable setup for Oduwamna in the top side, they are incredibly hard to put down. And um, ooh, the victor getting banned away I here. think that raises the priority on trying to ban away Larson Dazir oh, as yeah. well for the mid lane. Try and take out two of the premier scaling AP carries there for our mid. <laughs> Yeah, Ban Yumi. I, I do think that it is such an incredibly strong pick and giving it over to Trimby, who has already shown that he is very, uh, very adept on these enchanters can be a big risk as, yeah, it's either a zero Yumi that you're going to give over here to Rogue and I don't think you're particularly happy about either. Yeah, Pat gets banned. Now, when the Yumi has been banned, though, Rogue, uh, they made really good use of the Soraka as well. Trimby also played the Nami, these other healing supports. So I think they will have backups here. And this is the idea that you give up when you do ban the Yumi. I think that is such a big, big mistake to do against Larson, against Rogue. Huge first pick for them. We've seen in general that the Azir has been able to simultaneously provide a lot of pressure in lane, but then also scale. And as long as you can get through the couple of early skirmishes where he might be weaker, can avoid those, which thus far Rogue, especially given their long game time, has been able to. Ooh. Could be very tough, and oh, that could be a set Callista bottom lane there. A lot of power here for the Gambot lane. It's at least a set flex looking through to see if anyone else has played it anytime recently. In fact, uh, even looking at V's champ pool, I don't see any set on the summer split itself. So uh, it's 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 kind of blind all the way around. Lucian Nami wouldn't be a surprise here. It's been so common. And indeed, now makes Lucian tied his eighth pick, most pick champion. Yeah, summer and, onwards. And we're checking all the boxes for our, our rogue composition. Oh, yeah. You know, the, the set and strategy here for rogue. Aggressive bottom lane. They already got Larson, the premier AP scaling for mid lane. It's a it's a blind pick there on the Renekton. Also slammed down here for Gam. Bold here. I guess they're just assuming Odo is probably going to go, uh, you know, some sort of tank on the top side anyway. 
I uh, wonder if they will even go so far as to ban the Orn away from him, though. I really hope so. I think Orn, even when Renekton was very strong, has been, with the Grass build, a pick that actually can deal with it relatively well. But already, uh, the early power that Comp and Trimby will have in this lane, combined with the priority from Larson as well, is also going to give Malrung so much space to look for plays around the map. And overall, I think Gam still have a lot of flexibility in where they can take their draft. We've seen LCK team, for example, flex that set into top, Renekton into mid, and pick something else entirely with the Kalista. But as we, there we go, the Nidalee getting banned away works very well with both these two picks. I think Gam are going to need an actual counter pick to the Azir in mid lane, though, yeah. similar to like, you know, the Akali. Um, if you want to get real aggressive with it. So it, it's starting to pinch down. It's already looking like they're going to be melee heavy, short range team here for Gam. Could be difficult if the Azir goes untouched, you know, scaling into the late game. So they need some big counter pick here from Katy. And in that light, I really like the Poppy ban. Poppy is a pick that into what Gam have already have can completely throw off your entire game plan. So that at least I think is good as the Carphus. No, I want to see it. <laughs> Love it in drops like this. The only thing is it, all, it does leave up the Jarvan for Rogue for Malrog. Yeah. A lot of professional players have stopped even calling the champion Jarvan and just call it Malrog now Yeah, when you pick it. Yeah, that's okay. interesting in Korea. It's great. So Gray is going to come through. Plenty of carry damage. They certainly need magic damage somewhere. Now it's pretty much all Kati plays his champ pool. I mean, he's got more Morgana mids than Silas is. Like, he is actually exclusively a ranged mage player, essentially. So Akali would there be out of his typical champ pool. Pick Jarvan, wrong. Yep, his most played of the split. And it's going to be locked in here as well. So they've got engage. They've got backline damage out of Larson, whose ear has been very good. And now a top lane, I think Gragas would fit in the mold right after Maokai and Orn. Yeah, exactly. Looking for the tank top for Odo. And then you basically complete the Exodia okay. for Rogue. The same strategy that they used to go 3-0 in week one of this group. They implement it here versus Gam. I quite like the Nar. I do think it's a bit more execution heavy than some of the other picks we have seen, but it is certainly a pick that with things like the Jarvan and the Azir has a lot of additional setup as well for big ultimates and also into whatever gets up to top lane, looking like it will be the Renekton, is going yeah, to be quite strong as well. Oh, we're yep. brawling! Exactly! That's how you put some more threat behind this short range comp for Gam. You get the Galio in there because you know everyone on this Gam team is charging in, trying to get to that back line, get that engaged and you just throw the Galio ults on top, see if they can make those moves before they get outscaled and the Azir and the team fight take over for Rogue. The seventh Galio game post MSI, Summer Split onwards is gonna be back on something relatively comfortable and certainly fits the bashing coming through here. Set indeed is gonna be the support pick, not a surprise. Of course, once you're level six on the Kalista, gonna be relatively safe to pull the team fights out. I'm pretty sure you can hit confirm Kalista ult into your own, don't even have to burn your own stun. So you have some very good lockdown on the champions you wanna go for. And it's just going to be fun. I mean, an aggressive playstyle is going to be the look here. It's what they're going to be looking at for sure in this game. They peaked at a 627 gold lead against Rogue when they fought back in week one. We can hope for a lot more than that. <laughs> yes, they definitely are. And they gave Levi the Graves again. They gave Malrung the Jarvan again. Let's see about the early jungle action. Look at the respect here on stage. You'll love to see it. Very happy to see, and Gam, if they're going to go in early this time around, at least they have the comp that can really back it up. I think they might run into issues if they're not able to generate any of the leads, but with Renekton, Kalista, Sad, Galio, those early objectives and early skirmishes should be theirs. I think especially bottom lane. Bottom oh, yeah. lane is going to be so volatile here. So let's track Malrong's early pathing here on the Jarvan. Uh, because you definitely want to be able to support that Lucian Nami into the Kalista set. So blue gromp red, you're saying, is a likely path here. Level three Jawa to the bottom lane. On to Summoner's Rift here for the first game of the day. The LEC has gone zero and six so far in week two. Rogue, though, are undefeated, hoping to break the curse. Non sequitur, don't forget to link your league account with Prime Gaming to receive free digital goodies. Much like Rogue, might receive some free digital goodies courtesy of Gam. And one of these things that has become pretty common uh, for a lot of these junglers looking for the early path, start out with the control ward. Malrung has done it here on the Jarvan. So he's definitely not going to go for uh, a power clear, a full clear. Let's see what he can do to try and open up with this early control ward. Right now, very defensive opening, watching the entry points here for Rogue. And we have the recall. So Trimby has placed Trinket Ward in Tri-Brush, immediately went back, got the sweeper for bottom lane as well to be able to get that side brush control cleared out.
And not only is it important to make sure that you keep track of Morong to maybe shadow him if you are Levi to ensure that your bot lane can actually play far forward as I've seen this one before, Gam. And it is not spotted by any wards in, so a late track. This is by the time Lucian would normally leave and Oh, Comp, he's gonna get oh, Just sees that they're walking over, goes, okay, I'm out. Trinket Ward is not spotted by Comp himself, but that red buff is taken. This is intelligent from Gam, though, to do a red buff late in bay like this versus Maorong versus a Jarvan. You know this champion wants to go for early ganks. Trimby has the vision through the tri brush, though, gets a little bit of splash damage and stacks up the spell thief. So I think one of the strengths of the Renekton is that even in a matchup that is rough, like into the Nar, he is very self sufficient as Maorong. He's so not Smite was saved by it. Levi. Smite was saved. EQ combo gonna get a lot of it. Most of the camp is taken, but Smite still goes through to the Graves, who's leashed heavily enough. He's able to save it and get rid of some of that gold. Smarong indeed is gonna be towards the bottom lane, but I'm not sure Krugs be enough to get a level three. Yeah, it, really good denial star here for Gam, utilizing the power of this Graves early. Uh, Malrong, there were three oh. wards here through the red side jungle, so Gam know he's fishing around for something, and Kati comes back to get a little bit of a peek. I mean, he for sure saw that ward, right? I feel like he had to see the Trinket, but apparently he didn't. Gets knocked into the air, 200 HP. I mean, he can blast plan away, he's always gonna live. But Burns Ghost, wait, he... <laughs> okay. He's going back! He's, he's fine, I guess, trying to... He's, I guess he's trying to burn time? I don't know, Levi is taking the left side jungle. Very nicely done. It looks a little bit, a little bit dicey there. If Malrong is able to get the kill, but now you just waste time. Scotty, only thing it costs you is your ghost. Now we're gonna be a little low as Island PA going in here, maybe, but I don't know if they want to take the risk. Dive possibility here, maybe for the bot side of Rogue. Will this be the fourth camp that Levi takes away from the opposing jungle? Should we be able to smite this, or does he want to be the first? Flash okay. gun Renekton. Yeah, he wants to go for the rest of this one. Empower stuff for Renekton. Make sure you target the champions properly. Jumps over. Flash for the autos. The turret cannot block it. Levi has lived the entire game in Rogue's jungle. Huge, huge team effort to be able to sculpt this jungle difference for Gam. They, they make much better use this time with their Graves pick. Levi, delayed invade on bottom side, bully Maorong out, keep vision on him, track him with the bottom lane as well, and the mid laner. Everybody on Gam doing their part to get the information advantage and allow for that top side dive. And it's awesome to see the plan actually working out for Gam because you go back to those last week early game plays that they tried to set up. None of them really worked out, but now if you look, they've been able to build a sizable lead here for Levi. Yeah, and I will say while Levi is happy and Levi gets that first blood, mid lane paid a bit of a price there. Yeah. Uh, with the ghost down, with the uh, predator used on early as well, down significant amount of CS here and health versus Larson. And remember, the big star on the rogue comp is going to be this Azir. This Azir, if if left untouched, is going to scale into a monster. Well, Marwang does not get spotted on his way up there. That scuttle will never see that path. Is He's also not walking through any wards as well, so may just kind of make the play. Thing is, you expect the bottom camps to be mostly up. That's that's kind of the expectation of where Jarvan might be. But he's far enough away that a nice defensive flag gives a little more vision to Odo as he walks up for the, the combo right as Jarvan left the lane. I don't believe he had any info, but happens to guess it correctly. Levi going to be here to help clear the wave away, but really just poach a bunch of XP from this Galia who's having a completely horrible time here, Kadi getting just destroyed by Larson and Lane. Yeah, definitely needs the help to push out the wave to be able to get the recall off. No more potion charges left, uh, no more nothing there. So no teleport means gonna need a little bit of extra help. Larson pushes up to make sure uh, that he's actually going back right now and then lets the wave kind of linger here. It's already his second recall as well. He had to recall earlier, picked himself up the Dark Seal to try and stay in lane at least a little bit longer. But overall, the sacrifice that has been made has been that Galio. And without level six, I think you do lose a lot of the skirmishing power. So more agency for Levi, but he should actually be able to turn it into something. It looks like the Dragon has been started up here and yep. the bot lane also getting pushed in. Should be a first Drake here for Gam. Mauron is going to spot it. What's going on? Bot lane could move pretty soon, but will they have enough time to do anything? Last he has a blast steal. plant. He can always EQ out. He can always flash up. Well. They've got a Galio, though, and you can see the Nami's walking up. But with Renzax coming in, it's going to be harder and harder to steal. And it looks like there's enough pressure that's going to be claimed. Spike goes through. Gam gets the first Drake. And the threat of the Galio, even when he is this far behind, doesn't have his ultimate. The roam from KD means that, at the very least, uh, Rogue don't want to take the risk here. And I think they don't have to. Looking at the team composition, I think you feel perfectly comfortable giving up a couple of early objectives as long as you don't fall too far behind in terms oh. of goals. Comp jumps in for some damage. And honestly, Style takes the worst end of that trade. He's really happy to play. Even Levi's behind him. Arong is here as well, not on vision as the Jarvan. 
that bubble could have signaled the fight starting right now. Jarvan Lee still unseen walking up as you've got a roam for the Galio top side here as well. Odwan without TP, but has a Mega bar means there's no dive top side. Misjudging the resources there, and it means that it's some alone time here. The the mid roam is punished. Connie, there's an entire wave and nearly a plate. Exactly. The the unseen threat is actually the deadliest. While the camera's on all these side lanes and these skirmishes, Larson continues to farm up. 60 CS here for the Azir in mid lane. Constantly pushing in. Half a turret plate worn down as well as Maurang trying to get him some vision. Gets the Scuttle Crab on bottom side. The more poke. Half HP now on the Galley. He got a wave and half his health bar is gone. There's only a last chapter. It gets worse from here as Larsa keeps stacking up. He's going to try it yet again. At least this time with some honey fruit. Well, I'm not going to be on a recall. Easy to call that he has walked away and indeed Gonna maybe drop a wave here as he gets his health bar back up. And a lane that we haven't talked about as much that have been, has been happening mostly in isolation with Malrung threatening a little bit early on and, and Leva mostly spending his half on the top side of the map has been that bot lane. Comp and Trimby are feeling extremely comfortable. They're able to build up a sizable CS lead, not really getting threatened. And I do think that with a pick like this set, especially uh, if you don't find any early laning leads or at the very least find something around the Herald or his early skirmish, Fighting into this Lushinami, the later stage of the game, will become very, very tough. Yeah. Comp and Trimby, one of the least hyped parts about Rogue, but have been performing so incredibly oh, yeah. well here at World. Trimby on the Rakan game, as well as a lot of these aggressive uh, duo lane matchups that they have chosen throughout this group stage. A pretty tight game right now. Scaling does feel like it's on Rogue's favor here. The Azir is just going to be a massive menace in the late game. Gold pretty close thanks to the first blood, but better farming on the Rogue side. One Drake puts game ahead, but doesn't mean a whole ton. So out of combat move speed certainly can matter for the roaming plays. The Galio wants to, obviously. Along walks by his own blue, says, nah, it's actually going to be maybe the chance at a Rift Hero play, but first we'll walk towards top lane. Does get spotted, of course, put his own ward down, so Kiaia knows about that one. Blake goes down to the mid lane. Larson still crushing this lane. 81 to 50 in CS. 31 CS and a turret plate and a level. Not going to go for any kind of a flash taunt play there, Larson. It would have always been okay. To shuffle that afterwards. Man, always needing to call jungle to help push out this wave for the Galio. At least he's level six now. So first Galio ultimate play. Gam trying to force a little bit now. Get rid of the ward already. Wow, he's he got the armable blade here on the Levi's side. The first one helping that one. Flashlight comes in. Very good cleanse out of comp. The punch is okay. Keep mind style is six. They cannot all in onto the set. Wanting to find a good target, but Trimby is blocking, and they know. If you stun the Nami, Lucian will kill everyone, so a defensive ult, kind of on both sides. And they're going to get so much more out of this on the side of Rogue. Tr uh, Comp and Trimby can now push in on that bottom turret, get turret plates, while Maron clears out a lot of this vision around the Rift Herald. See about the fight here, though. It also means if there was a Rift Herald planned for Gam, they have to cancel it now, because their bottom lane would have to go all the way back to Fountain to heal back up before they could actually come to the fight. Bottom lane dominance there for the Rogue duo. Oh. Up on both sides, yeah. Hey, oh. one, thank you very much. Watch for the fog. DY4 unleash. Yeah. Malrog's able to get it and then slides over to the Rift Herald. Let's see, does he have another charge coming up? He does. He had saved up two charges of the smite. So he could use one on the red buff as well as now getting this Rift Herald, knowing that his bottom lane, again, gives him priority because they won the 2v2 health uh, on bottom side. They get to roam first. And you got to be taking this fight. You can't give up a Rift Herald with a composition like this. I Gav is in position. Right, big smite available. Flash the Q is the wall. Oh, he is the wall. The old mist as well. It's going to be going to Rogue. At least the kill is south. The eye might not be there. Top's not going to be in range. Despite Cotty having a flash. They're going back in for it. W. There's the ball wrong engage. Jumps right back out. Tucked in by the set. What a huge haymaker. And Gav Esports now 3-0. Would love the eye, but it's gonna despawn. And such an important fight for Gam, because this is the point where your composition spikes. Rogue think thus far we've been able to match, we've been able to read them very well, but they overstep and lose Malrong. They certainly do. What was that re-engage? They have no timing there, no Meganar to go in to follow it up, and Gam just ripped them apart. And with that, they're also gonna get a second Drake. And I think now, with that mistake, Rogue has given Gam an actual way to keep a foothold in this game. If you can get to Soul Point very early on, you can force Rogue to fight three item spikes. In an awkward position, Rogue, though, doesn't want to give it over. Arunk does have EQ and Smite. Rend in the 
Nice. Okay. Good timing there. Yes. Dog gets the 800. Oh. But will there be an engage? Mauer would love this fight. His have his own ulti. Shuffle comes in. What a flash sets up to Larson is the one with the mid lane. He wants to win the entire damn game. Larson comes in. The big Azir. That should be. Uh, the carry of this team later as Malrog transitions through the disappearing terrain there with the arrival of the Infernal Rift. My goodness, though, Larson said, okay, this is how you go for an engage uh, in that play. Here's another look at the Rift Barrel, though, as it went down 17 health as they were able to get it. But then all the Rogue members had to get out of there, flash away, and they're out. And then they go back in. Yeah, and you're, you've got a mini NAR, and Larson is smoke screened. I think maybe the communication there was like, hey, Maorong engage, and Larson would follow it up there with the engage, but the Azir was smoke screened, so he was completely blind in the play, and then it's just Maorong going in by himself, while Odo goes up to the top side as a mini NAR. They're completely disjointed, so here they make up for it. Larson goes in. This is how you get the engage done. And these exit kills are really important because it prevents that snowball, right? Getting the extra stats from the Drake already are a big boon for Gam. And um, if they're able to just get that objective for free, get a back in and then start roaming out on the map, looking for side lane plays or collapses with this Galio. I think you hit the nail on the head there with the win cons for Gam though, because they have to stack these yeah. dragons, you know? You got this it. is a ball comp. They're very short range. It is a stack dragons, or else we are going to be in big trouble later. They do not siege well. They do not do much else well, except group up around those neutral objectives uh, and get those fat engages. It's a blue buff steal, though. Marwang's around, though. Galley, of course, could be here. Just back in, gets hit by the wall, though. Wants the taunt, and that'll buy some time. The stopwatch is burned. He's actually going to be near-sighted there as well. A shuffle backwards gets away from Larson. He is around. Kati does have flash, but his W should still be on cooldown. Cannot find his way in. Nice juke there from Levi. Kind of scary as Larson had just gotten the Luden's Echo power spike here for Azir. So could have been a lot of damage there. Uh, avoids certain death. And overall, that's a favorable trade for Gam because it means that in a subsequent fight, maybe for example around that possible soul point, Malrang won't have the stopwatch available anymore to go for more high risk engages without the risk of him getting blown up. Nice. Looking to the top side right now. Down. Ooh. About six camps, but will it matter if you can win the 2v1 with Lomna? Then against the ulti up in time and a power Q for Kiai. You know, goes for the stun. She might be on cooldown. Heals up. And it's still going to be a kill. Levi needs to find this one back. But Meganar for Odo. Can make it happen? The Q comes through. But can he fight a Meganar? Does not dodge the Q himself. Levi going to dodge around. Stun's going to land. Galio and a flash away. Odo Lomna gets his kill. But a hang on, though, because it's a 2v1. 2v2 now. Here comes a cross set. Tidal Wave oh! is perfect by Trippy, but if Flash Ignite finds the kill, next taunt's got to be up pretty soon, but he's going to get out. Oh, there's no counterplay to a Flash Ignite. Set comes in, takes down Odo. Trinity forces complete him as he dies in his back end base, though. Wow, the skirmish here on top side never stops. And again, I argue with no flash on the NAR, Odo's potential in the next fight will be somewhat diminished. Initially, this looks like a really nice setup. They're actually able to kill the Renekton before that sustain does come through. But I think playing into a Galio comp, going for really aggressive skirmishes like this is always going to feel like a risk. Although we do see that in the end, just a second too late. God, Odo was perfect there. He literally hit every spell for a minute straight. In, the, in this skirmish on the top side, and that allowed him to barely get the kill onto Levi. In the end, though, nothing he could do about the flash ignite, and it is answered here for Gam. Keeping the pace of this game so quick that you have to keep track of these dragon timers. 52 seconds on the clock. That is imperative. I think pretty crucially is the fact that there is, oh, there's Odorama going in for a play. He's got teammates around. Malron coming around. Be the same. Style could be the kill. The keep mind, it's Meganon. It's not an easy fight here. He's going to try for the front line. Lands the stun into the knockup. And there's the Wombo combo. Settles backwards. This could be a kill to Odo, who doesn't have escape tools. Taunt's going to land. They'll find that kill. But Levi's caught alone. Levi over the wall. And a calling takes him down. Comp makes it a 4v3 on the map. That is huge for Rogue. It's a disaster for Gam because we're 20 seconds away from the dragon. Rogue can now try and stop that dragon stacking. Levi, 20 seconds. The jungler for Gam will be in base. And if you can keep Levi alive, I think that's a good trade for Gam. Style so weak, just 
finished. His Immortal Shield, though, he doesn't have anything to offer besides making sure that Set can actually play the game. But with Levi getting caught off, really nice pick there by Rogue. I think that that possibility of a really early Drake, a really early Soul Point being available for Gam, no longer on the table. They're gonna get this Drake. I think Gam realizing finally they do have to back up this one. They've got Callista back in the mouth, and still no jungler. This fight fight will not be there in Rogue. You see, sitting on a 700 gold lead, and now their first Drake of the game. EU fans can breathe their first sigh of relief here. I think that big window, that yeah. big pressure point, uh, has just been avoided. Of course, it is going to be a long run towards the end, but this GAM composition that they've drafted in this game is very short range, does not scale very well. The one thing that Rogue does have to take into account with compositions like this is that a single misposition, even if you are in terms of 5v5, I think vastly superior in the later stage of the game. Still need to respect that Galio. Uh, KT thus far hasn't had the biggest impact, but if you misposition at any point in time, as we kind of saw here uh, initially, as Odo feels very confident, has Morang on the way as well, and I think initially this player looks very, very good. It's the teleport that's the big difference maker here. Yeah. Odo hits again, hits the wall up into the Nar ultimate. Uh, getting the one-for-one one here, best out of a bad situation. Gam with the collapse. Uh, biggest thing, of course, was Levi getting picked off as he gets bubbled here. They're right back on the offensive. Tribulance with a good crowd, which keeps comp safe. Who doesn't have to run a single summoner spell, just the, just the Nami tidal wave. And Nar on the way down, a full bar for Odo. He can be pretty useful here. This will not quite kill the entire turret, but it will put it down. Oh, actually it does. I'm surprised it has just enough of the charge, but I think no one got local turret gold. At the very least, they'll be able to open up the map and getting down that mid lane turret giving yourself the opportunity to maybe find a flank with something like Renex and get back line access because thus far i think comp especially if summoners up is basically impossible to kill now the game becomes can rogues oh. the uh oh they're gonna find the first time pretty good damage they're locked in place and levi gets his third kill as we're about to pose the question can a rogue keep these side lanes under control while avoiding getting collapsed on nope the brush play from gam catches them by surprise they pick off the side lane here odo down then push on the turret as well the uh, probably a trade of turrets at this point you can see bot lane of course outer already dropped the top lane gonna be attacked and all this gold is basically going to leave but you can see how often he is Essentially taking the golden XP sort of from his mid laner, I guess. Yeah, Graves is a bigger carry than Galio, right? I'm not saying this is like a bad set of resource allocation, but it does mean that you've got a pretty small mid laner. I thought you were going to ask for him to buy a support item. <laughs> That's what I was waiting for. Give me a relic shield, buddy. I mean, th these are the, the roots of Gam. You know, when they made the, the most spectacular splash on the international scene, it was turbo feeding jungle. It was always about funneling into jungle. Then it was the Nocturne, earliest level six uh, in competitive play for a jungler. Now, this time around, it is the Graves, the premier carry jungle of the tournament. Levi trying to soak up as much as he can. While all of this chaos has been happening, though, we, we checked in to Larson about 10, 15 minutes ago, maybe, when he was yeah. sitting at 60, P uh, 60 CS at, at six minutes, about to hit 200. Completely happy, unbothered, two items, sword pen boots done as well. And especially with that Drake being given over to Rogue, I think the game just gets so much harder for Gam as they look for an engage. Right again, onto Larson. They get uh, slow, but not enough for the rest of it. Cotty forced out yet again. So much damage there. Of course, B can tank. It can always be Clist ulted away. But this full flat pen build out of his ear. He's the only meaningful meta damage threat on his team. No one else wants to buy MR, and he is going to deal true damage to everyone. And, and comp with the massive ulti, getting the health bars of both the Galio and the set just chunked out, gives them this amount of control. Just look at Summoner's Rift right now. Stealing away the blue, taking down the second outer tower here in mid lane, and just opening up this jungle for counter jungling opportunities. And it's really tough for Gam because they have to play that far forward. They can't afford to just sit back. As already pointed out, they can't really siege. And if their second two objectives, for Rogue, it's so easy to just throw a culling or have Larson poke for a couple of seconds. And at that point, it's looking much stronger. Yeah, for Gam to shine now, they just have to split engage. Just kill them. Quit li yeah, exactly. Don't leave any time for Rogue to poke you out, to hit you with one of those cullings. Just go for the snap engage. Get to the back line, try and take down the Azir as quickly as possible. Uh, and that being said, Comp as well, going to be very dangerous to deal with since he's got the cleanse flash in this one. You need more uh, engage opportunities on the back line. All right, Drake is in 30. 
Gold's still pretty close. The item spikes are what matters here. There is no stopwatch on the mid lane side for Gamma. In fact, there's none anywhere on the right side of inventory. Larson has one, though. Larson has Flash. We saw how big his play was last time he had it in the bottom river. And it feels like the backline carries of Rogue are just gigantic, each with two full items. That's where my eyes are. Can somehow there be an outplay on Gamma's side? All right, this is what I want to see, the support here. Yeah, can we get the engage? Two kills for himself. Gets a really early uh, turbo chem tank. Maybe with that speed, ultimate in, get the Galio combo with set. That big AOE is what Gam are hoping for. Ooh, and you gotta find both. You can't just get Larson or Comp. Need to somehow get both of them. I think the dragon is already gone. But can there be a team fight afterwards? Maybe they get the battle instead. Drake will be claimed. Is there a team fight? Is the question? Every single one, except the Nami, can jump the wall. Oh, the problem. But everyone else has dashed away, so it's a. I mean, I take that every day of the week. A Drake for a single flash. That's great from Rogue. <laughs> It's perfect! Oh! And a kill! And a kill, almost. It's Style Force to flash away to stay alive. Double summoners blown there by Style by Gam. The surprised uh, Teemo face there from Comp. Not exactly surprised as they get Dragon number two and they continue to increase their volume of control across this map, rotating up towards the top side by that Baron, dropping all the wards. And I think a core issue with the GAM team composition, if you don't build a substantial lead early, which they were able to match Rogue, sure, but the actual hard engage outside of straight up throwing BA into multiple people is pretty lackluster. You're going to be looking for either a flank, making sure that Renekton or Set can actually get into the enemy backline, but with how well Rogue have been playing in terms of vision and in terms of respecting, GAM just don't seem to find any openings here. Well, they are going to have to force an opening if they want to win this game then. But how? You gotta group up, I go know. through Fog of War, and just run at them. Just, just kill them. Yes. Just run. <laughs> can't that can't wait. The, run through the darkness. It is yeah. the only hope. Through Nami and Azir, so winning you out, slowing you the whole way through. It's gonna be a tough one. We'll see if Gam can find their way in. Technically, elimination not found uh, for Gam with the loss. They're, you can do the big, I believe, two and four three-way tie and have Rogue go six and oh. It's the exact same route that uh, I believe it was Evil Geniuses had the last time around. Uh, and similarly, Rogue don't technically lock either as there could be a big three-way tie at four and two, but obviously winning helps in either case. <laughs> you never are set poorly by a win, so Rogue Looking winning good, in this good. Got winning it. good, yeah. Thank uh, you. This is why I'm a play-by-play. -play. My yeah. analysts, my analysis I'm, skills are that deep. I'm very happy. Oh, Levi, yoink! All right, we get at least a little bit. You gotta count every win. The small ones here, taking yeah. away the red buff, taking away the raptors. And they are grouped up looking for the charge through the river. Not my spots it, though. What's going on? He's like, yeah, cool. You're near me, that's nice. Hang on, man. I'm still gonna bodyguard this. Y your CC is not that big of a surprise, it's slow. Comp is also a full item ahead of Callista right now. This Lucian does so much damage. The culling. Ow. Yep. Two thirds now on set. And it's Rogue once again bullying their way through the map. It's the poke, right? It's, it's even Naris poking. Odo Omne is just throwing out those auto attacks, throwing out the boomerang, getting hyper procs. And every single time we see Gam go forward, someone gets chunked to half. And there is a teleport. Blank. This is the play. Now Comp could be targeted. Gale forces out. Flash is still up. And no one gets onto him. A tidal wave out. Saves the big summoner spells. The important thing. Only low cooldowns are gone. Still going. He yeah, is going to get the top backwards into the root. A lot of damage to the front line. Nogan, but a TP. Sorry, Flash away. Kiaya gets his Derek Larson. And now self ults. Get ready for the rest of it. Yeah, Larson is coming down. They need to ult him away. He's got to live somehow. The shield comes in. A flash backwards. Time built by Galio. It's a shutdown, but it's a one for one. A flash away, but here's big Meganar. Finds his stun, gets the combo. Style stays alive for a second, but not any longer than that. Say goodbye to Gam Esports in this game because Rogue is here. Rogue are able to kite out the initial engage, and they're going to run straight for Baron after that one. Rogue read them like a book. Maorong dead, no problem whatsoever. He draws out so many cooldowns. Comp, as you pointed out, Freak, didn't even have to use his summoners when they tried to go for a flank TP. And the subsequent fight, it's just Gam desperately trying to make this composition work. But it's not gonna happen. Well, they happen to wait out the seconds required for their mid laner or their jungler to respawn. Baron claimed by Trimby's Nami. Odo will not get this kill, I don't think. 
again, you got a set coming around, but still, it is a five-person Baron buff, and Rogue completely in control of this one. Exactly, and then with the Baron-empowered recall here, they can uh, reset and have plenty of time to get their control wards to move it back out, get that Dragon number three for themselves, uh, and not give a single neutral objective over to Gam. Here's the overchase here through the jungle, but as we said, Gam don't have a lot of options. They, they have to throw everything into whichever target is available, Mulren goes through Flash, and this looks good because Larson isn't actually there yet. He's not doing any damage. Now is the moment they realize. They're like, oh, no, oh, run away. Oh, no, he's like, coming. We have to get out of there, but they're not able to. Exactly. You get the one for one, uh, but the Galio ultimate being used oh. says, Odo Wamne, I've got a clear spot. Right in there, flashes, ult style against the wall, follows up with the wall up, and then Larson can sweep in. No danger on the Azir. They pick up every last little bit of gold on the map, and now they're back out to Dragon. You can see in the mini-map here on the bottom side. That looks like desperation. Now, I don't know how you win this fight against a uh, Baron buff here as well, but they might try. Blast plan over. Smite not going to happen there for Levi. Dunk onto many. Will he find the stun? Yes, a bit. Stopwatch, no, pulled back in by Callista. This team fight not like it happened. Actually jumps back away, and that means they've got infinite target access, and style goes down. And they're going to go for the oh, no. cleanup. The question oh, is, no. the question is, how many more does Rogue kill? The bubble lands perfectly after the ward goes down. A stun comes across. Levi gets the kill on a Trimby, but he got the back line engaged. Still there. Pick up on the Renekton. There's a shuffle on a two. The punch doesn't mean a whole hell of a lot. And it's Rogue up 13 to 9. They're going to remain undefeated, all right. Rogue chasing down Galio now. Can they find the last one? This one going for the execute. Nope, he's dead. Not happening. Meanwhile, mid and bot, we see the push in Odomne and Comp both making their way over. And you gotta give credit to Gam, they get to try, but Rogue is just way too far ahead, both in terms of reading the game plan from Gam, as well as this position, their item composition so much stronger. And, and when they finish out this game, Rogue, this does so much for them. The heroes of the LEC here, moving up to four wins a premier spot in this group. More gold on the Larson here as well. Rebel Baron power play, 6,000 gold. A good smite there from Malra. And I want to highlight how much Trimmy did in this fight because he hit so many key bubbles that meant that the rest of his team had so much more space. Hit the one there as uh, the attempt of engage came through. Gonna hit another one here on Katie, who is trying to set up a hero Galio play. Maybe looking for a multi-man taunt. Not going to be the case. Gets cancelled, and Rogue played out slow and cleanly. Yeah, yeah they give up. They give up Trimby to, to the Renekton. It happens. One sacrifice for each team fight. Last time it was Mauron, this time around Trimby. Rogue will pick them all up. They clean the map completely. And they've yeah. reset already, looking to finish the job. Mid lane inhibitors already open, so they've got easy access. It's how you make sure you get full credit for your team fight, because if everyone gets an assist, you know, their death score, right? It, it, you know, they're back to 300 gold value. So, it, you know, it ensures your team fights are worth the max amount of gold possible, so I think it's very, very smart. Optimization. Sacrifice. Very good. Sacrifice one person worth 450 gold, and you end up getting probably at least that much back, with everyone else getting, you know, 50 more gold on their kill. I yeah. like it. Yeah. Time to close the game out I here for Rogue. I appreciate the creativity, because yeah. it's not it's not looking good for Gam. It is not, and it's looking worse now. Levi nearly dies. Okay, we got a flash play in here to set by much to set up. As Look for a bit more. Everyone's out of range now. Malrog, not an easy target. Looking for the root. Looking for the flash taunt. You're going to catch exactly one. A turret went down. Gaia wants the back line. He can't find it. Sterex pop finds a stun. Gets a quick heal. Still dies. Comp is godlike indeed. Finds a double legendary for the Lucian. Comp is just untouchable. No matter how much they throw at him, they can't get to him. And the reason is Malrog walks in and he blocks the Callista ultimate. Great block from him, the bodyguard. Then Larson came in and he shoved off. He zoned the entire backline away, chasing down the remnants once again, and Rogue are going to finish it. Finally, a win on the board for the LEC in the second week, and more than just that, Rogue are 4-0. and zero. Rogue are dominating their group here at Worlds as they will close down one last bit of KDA. They will take the Nexus, and they will go 4-0 and in the group. Warm-up game going pretty well here for the LEC champs. 
Looking like it's going to be a good day for them. Looks like it really was just an A uh, that was able yeah. to take him down. And want to give full credit to Rogue because uh, not only do we see the usual great performances from Larson, from Com, but also shout out to Odo Omne, who actually was moved off of a tank and sure got caught a couple of times in side lane. But when you look at his impact in team fights, still had a really good performance on the NAR. Yeah, I think really good heart selection. Had some good flash in the back line to help to clean up there. Play this drop well. And I mean, this is what it is. They have a very aggressive bottom side. They have an outstanding mid laner in Larson, who was a gigantic mid gap in that one. I mean, there was. It felt like Galio couldn't breathe the whole way through. It felt like, ah, Victor Van, we take his ear. You have no matchups left. And that's what it looked like immediately, was he just had no matchups left. They could stand up to Larson. And it meant that once he came to team fights, Azir did whatever he wanted with the giant gold even the item lead, and he went every fight. Yep, successfully outscaled there. Rogue, nicely done for them, avoiding the possibility of the early downfall. The only thing that could have caught them would if they got sucked into this snowball, constant engages, Galliol's coming down on their heads. Yep. But the, the discipline up there on stage kept them safe. I love the discipline, and I love that they were very acutely aware of maybe there's going to be a teleport flank, maybe they're going to be looking for an angle, but unfortunately for Gam, none of them worked out. The big carries had the cooldowns available every time, which is really impressive. Comp, deathless in that game, beautifully done. Now we are getting closer and closer to closing out our group stage and taking the next step toward the Summoner's Cup in San Francisco. But if you are not able to join us in the arena for the finals, do not fear. The League of Legends World Championship is coming to the big screen at select theaters near you. Use the QR code below to grab your tickets. If your browser supports it, if what you watch supports it, you just pause and then do the, do the thing. Or press left there. Who knows? You can find it out <laughs> all the way. Anyway, we're gonna head. We're gonna hear from Larson in a few moments. But when we set that up, we're gonna hear first from the State Farm Analyst Desk. Thank you so much, Freak. The undefeated streak for Rogue continues here in the World's 2022 Group Stage as they move to 4 and 0. Oh. A quick update on stakes and what this means overall for the group. Well, of course, it will aid them in their effort to get out of the group. It does not quite lock Rogue into the knockout stage. There is a scenario where we have a three-way tie at 4 and 2 between the top three teams that have to play tiebreaker, but they're at least guaranteed a tiebreaker to get out. On the flip side, even with this loss, Gam is still not locked out of the knockout. And so that will depend on the next game that they play in just a moment against top esports. But let's talk about how Rogue got it done. Starting out on the right foot as we welcome Raz onto the desk. Thank you. To help us break things down for the rest of the day. Raz, talk to me. I mean, one momentum, we've already, we already know how much that can mean. But kicking it off in the way that they did here against Gam, a very measured, steady game. Yeah, and I think it started off a little harder. Uh, it was a good look from Levi early on, the level one invade that he did uh, pretty early on, actually, versus top esports in uh, the week before. And then this early Rift Herald was puzzling because, hey, Gam stepped up to the plate and Rogue actually got out. It was Malrung that re-engaged, though, and started it actually being a good fight there for Gam Esports. Yeah, and obviously, like you mentioned, Raz, they didn't have to take this fight, but after this, the rest of the game, and in particular, I want people to be looking at Larson right here, because this was kind of the difference maker in terms of turning the tide for this composition, which I think already had kind of better scaling, and the ease of execution is also there, because this is something we've seen from Rogue so many times in the LEC. Yeah, I mean, look, especially when you look at the Azir, right, the most played champion for Larson, it's been yep. such a big pick for him, and I I understand why Gam were coming out of the gates throwing haymakers, right? This was a composition that needed to get the ball rolling, but it was brawly back and forth, so much going both ways. And just in the end of it, Rogue were able to kind of keep in check until they got to their later game. That's a really good point, Dog, though. Like, the, this is the quintessential Rogue composition. Just even looking at the bottom side of the map, the Lucian, Nami for Trimby and Comp, mm -hmm. uh, Malrong on J4, like, and Odo on Nar. All of these picks are ultra comfort picks. And I love the fact that they just but tit for tat with what Gam Esports are great at. The skirmishes were back and forth, but it felt like Rogue were just getting better at them. It's everything they wanted from the comp to the victory, kicking off week two in just the right fashion. We're heading down to the stage for the Ryzen postgame interview with Larson and Shox. Thank you very much indeed. Rogue, they do not stumble at the first hurdle as they take down Gam. We were just chatting a little bit, and you said you maybe weren't completely happy with the way it went, but a win is a win. A win is a win, and after seeing... Oh, shit. That's okay. After seeing the other EU teams lose uh, against NA the first game, it was a bit scary, but uh, I'm just happy we got to win, even though I think if we played better, it could have been like an 18-minute victory. If we played like Pixar Perfect, like top two team. But 
Yeah, we got the win. Uh, I like that you mention it because we've seen how it's gone the last couple of days. It can be annoying, I know. Um, we've seen how it's gone the next couple of days and the influence of that first game plus kind of the all-around disappointment, I feel like, of the European fans. So um, what did you do to kind of mentally just stay in the right moment and say, okay, guys, nothing has changed. Let's play like we are 0-0 and we still have all our games to win. Uh, we just take it game by game. I mean, we don't overthink. We're just playing the game. Like, we're sitting on stage and playing the game we're used to playing. I think we have, like, a turbo win streak right now as well. So we're, like, really confident. Uh, yeah, I think we're just, like, in really good shape. And yeah, we're just not overthinking. We're just taking it game by game. <laughs> Uh, I did notice that, for instance, in this one was almost like an Exodia comp for, for your strengths in terms of what you got. And I feel like overall that's been the case. You've been able to draft very much through what you like. How big is your confidence that when a curveball is thrown your way in the next couple of games, you'd be able to change your game plan? Uh, I think it's hard for enemies to like do much about it because there's so many open picks right now and they can't like bend them all out. So I think we always get something really like very happy with. So. I don't, th I don't think there's much they can do, but if they try to throw a curveball, I mean, we'll be fine. Yeah. Okay, that might very well happen versus uh, top or DRX. Of course, your best bet would be to just win those two games. Which of these is going to be the hardest hurdle, you think? Uh, I think both are good teams. Uh, I just want to win both and go 6-0 because that's pretty giga chat. And I'm, yeah. <laughs> that would be very giga chat. Um, final question. Uh, I know your teammates and you have talked a lot about kind of how the, the rogue fan base is swelling, you know, more people are getting interested. Also the last CU team to defend the hope. So how have you enjoyed just getting the cheers here in America for rogue? Oh, they've been a great crowd sharing for EU as well, even though they're from, M from NA mostly. Uh, I guess we're the West Hope, so I guess that's why they're sharing for us maybe, but <laughs> yeah, they've been great. Awesome. <laughs> they have. Thank you very much, Larson. Good luck in the rest of the day. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we'll see GAM once again as they go up against Top Esports. Be right back. <laughs> they actually do the Mattel tactic. I love it. What is it? What are they saying? They're just writing, oh, we're so good, guys. Uh, yeah, 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 so yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Karsi did it as well. Oh, guys, we can't win against you. Yeah, <laughs> oh. But will there be in a game? How are we love this fight? Is that his own old D shuffle comes in? What a flash! Sets up two! Larson is on his way to the mid lane. He wants to win the entire damn game! But here's big Meganar. Finds his stun, gets the combo. Styles stays live for a second, but not any longer than that. Say goodbye to Gabby. Behind 21 epic days of epicness. Behind one billion hours of drop joys. Behind every match, every broadcast, every moment at League of Legends World Championship 2022 is the network capable of making it all happen. The Cisco Network, aka The Realm. Cisco, powering the future of esports.